Welcome to the Globe Mission Mosquito Informal and Citizen Science Webinar today. We have two great presentations from exceptionally wonderful folks, um, Dr. Lisa Gardner on Zika Zine, and then Sarah Quasenberry and Rachel Fite from the Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library. Uh, starting this out will be uh, Dr. Lisa Gardner, the author and illustrator of, of two um, amazing publications, Tales from an Uncertain World has won all kinds of awards. And then she's also the illustrator and author and creator of Zika Zine, the story of three 80s mosquitoes and the Zika within them. Hi, everyone. I do. I just had so many windows open that <laughs> I didn't want to share them all with you. <laughs> Could be overwhelming, but hello, everyone. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you all today and um, to tell you a bit about the Zika zine. And uh, this is a short story of three 80s mosquitoes and the Zika within them. Um, and it is intended to help um, informal education audiences, kids of all ages, including adult kids, um, learn more about mosquito ecology and um, and Zika and mosquito-borne diseases, but in a fun, festive, and non-intimidating format. A, a zine, um, I'll define that word, uh, so that a zine is, uh, for our librarian folks, they, they know what a zine is probably, but a zine is a, a small, usually kind of informal, um, hand-produced magazine that, um, is uh, I mean that's that's where the word came from, and um, zines were produced um, largely on on copiers, um, Xerox machines, that kind of thing, 20, 30 years ago, and now they're produced in all sorts of different formats. Um, now that we have kind of you know digital ways of producing them, but in this case, the Zika zine um, is. Uh, a story told in comics, and I, I'm a science educator and an author illustrator, um, and uh, so I was really happy to be able to um, develop this little story and this zine to help people understand mosquitoes and how we can reduce our risk of getting diseases like Zika. So um, before I get started, I need to remember to, to say that the Zika zine was developed with funding from the Department of State, the U.S. Department of State as an educational resource for GLOBE. Um, and it's, uh, you know, part of this project that you're all a part of, as I understand it, to get people all over the world to track mosquitoes and their habitats and hopefully reduce the amount of mosquito habitats um, as well. But the, the zine, the Zika zine uses a um, fictional story uh, to help people learn about um, many different topics like where mosquitoes live, uh, particularly Aedes mosquitoes, the, the type of mosquito that largely transmits Zika, uh, why they bite, why mosquitoes bite, how they carry and transmit disease, how you can stay safe, and how NASA and citizen scientists are helping to identify mosquito habitats and limit the places where mosquitoes can breed. So uh, the Zika zine tells the story through comics. And despite this very cartoonish appearance um, of the mosquitoes and their ability to talk, which of course actual mosquitoes do not talk, um, the, the story accurately portrays 80s mosquito ecology. And I got Rusty Lowe's help to, um, the mission mosquito scientist to help me make sure that I got the ecology and biology correct uh, throughout the story so that the story could be uh, fictional and, and non-intimidating, but the science in it is really solid. So I'd like to introduce you to the three stars of the Zika zine. Um, there is Maurice. Now, Maurice is everyone's favorite. Um, he's a male mosquito, so he doesn't bite people or other animals, and you can recognize him by his mustache. 
Um, while this is not entirely biologically accurate, uh, the mustache is a lot like a pair of antenna that uh, mosquitoes have in front of their eyes. And so we, we gave Maurice a bit of a mustache. And then there's Hester, and she's a bit of a know-it-all. I'm sure we all know someone like Hester. Um, and so she has a lot of things to say, but she is not always correct. So um, that's something to keep in mind. But she often does give helpful advice to Wanda. And Wanda, um, recently became an adult mosquito and she's trying she's still trying to learn the ropes of how to be an adult mosquito and somewhere along the way wanda winds up with zika inside of her the, the zika in this little slide here is not the scale this is cartoon zika uh, but this is what zika virus looks like under a microscope so uh, it is greatly enlarged so that you know it's there and it can it can actually talk, which of course doesn't happen in the nonfiction world. Um, but why fiction? Uh, so this, uh, the zine is a fictional story. Um, there are talking mosquitoes, uh, yet the intent is to help people learn real science. And I'm sure if there's any librarians on the webinar today, uh, you can think of lots of examples of children's books that uh, teach science through a fictional story. Um, and, you know, this, of course, is not the same thing as science fiction. The science is real, um, but the storyline helps guide you through it. So in this project, I wanted to use a fictional story because we're so often told what to do when it comes to our health and safety. Um, and sometimes those messages sound a lot like orders. Um, we could have said, don't leave standing water around, otherwise mosquitoes will breed. Um, but instead, we're telling readers a story of how these little mosquito characters um, how they breed, where they live, um, how they exist, to help people make informed decisions about what to do about their standing water. Uh, also, um, I guess another argument for fiction was that I'm, I'm a bit of an ecologist as uh, part of my background. And so even though mosquitoes carry harmful diseases and are quite annoying, um, I'm also inclined to see them as part of an ecosystem. And I think that the fictional story helps with that too. So they're animals, just like we are. Um, of course, the real mosquitoes don't talk, but, um, and of course we don't bite. Uh, so I guess that's, well, most of us don't bite. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's why this is a fictional story. And now I want to give you a few of the um, the main messages that the, the story uh, teaches. So this is looking at the parts of the story and then how they are used to teach science. For example, um, to help readers learn that young mosquitoes look very different in their larval and pupa form, Hester introduces herself. Um, and she thinks she's the only mosquito around because the other guys look so different. Um, but she's really exasperated because the others think that they're mosquitoes too. And uh, they're just not adults yet. But she learned something that day that mosquitoes can look very different in different stages of life. So another example, Wanda first becomes an adult mosquito and she asks Hester, who, um, who to bite, like how does she know who to bite? And she learns through experience about how mosquito netting prevents mosquitoes from getting in. Um, and while this is very sad for Wanda, it's a very good thing to know and to help keep readers safe. And then there's Maurice. Maurice has big dreams. Um, he got himself a little spacesuit because he thought that he might get to be the first mosquito astronaut. Um, he learned that NASA can help find mosquito habitats using satellites, um, but he had kind of misunderstood and, and maybe, you know, he, he had big dreams. So he wanted to, uh, see if NASA was interested in having him join the Mosquito Space Program. But his dreams, alas, are dashed. So female mosquitoes drink blood um, while well, they 
kindly give us mosquito bites, but all mosquitoes also drink the nectar from flowers, which means that they're pollinators. So uh, mosquitoes are both useful and dangerous, I guess is the, the um, big idea there. And then 80s mosquitoes, unlike other genera of mosquitoes, they reproduce in containers full of water like spare tires, soda bottles, trash cans that fill up with water during rainstorms. Even a bottle cap can be enough space for mosquito eggs. And, uh, and so in this uh, part of the, the story, the mosquitoes are a little confused why humans wouldn't like them because humans are creating such great places for them to lay their eggs. And uh, one more. Uh, so Wanda, Wanda is just horrified when she learns that she's carrying Zika virus. Um, she feels a little violated. She, uh, she had an argument with the Zika, uh, but it reminds her that while it's very small, it's also very powerful because it can make people sick. So uh, the Zika zine uh, also includes a section in which Maurice and Wanda, the mosquitoes, are making observations of a citizen scientist who is making observations of them. And, um, and they're curious about what she's doing, but they're also a little concerned because they're, they didn't know that they were being watched. So the, the citizen scientist that Maurice and Wanda are observing is helping NASA track uh, mosquitoes using the Globe Observer app on her phone. And um, as Maurice and Wanda are making their observations, they, um, they're also kind of documenting her methods of how she is making her observations. So while this is not a how to use the Globe Observer app, um, the Mosquito Habitat Mapper, it, it is the, the mosquito perspective on, on the app. Um, so she uses a dropper to suck up some larva from an old tire filled with water, and then she puts uh, the mosquitoes on a white plate so she can identify them. Um, she uploads a picture to the website. Uh, and then she uses a magnifier on her phone to look at the larvae up close, and they feel enormous um, when they are magnified. But uh, she's looking at them up close to identify what type they are, and then she takes their picture and counts them. So uh, through this process, her observations and the observations of mosquito larvae all over the world is going into this database that helps us understand where mosquitoes are breeding and, and how to stop uh, the spread of them. But um, the making of the Zika zine, so I've been, uh, since the Zika zine came out a few months ago, I've been getting a lot of questions about why I did this, which is sort of off-putting because you know, it makes perfect sense to me, but, uh, but I, I hadn't really thought about how did I come to this point? But I had uh, a few years ago been communicating about the science of weather through a series of comics on the UCAR blog. UCAR um, is the organization I work for in Colorado. And um, it was a project that uh, was called Earth's Teachable Moments, in which I take um, something from the news that was weather climate oriented and then help explain it through comics. And uh, for example, in this case, it's the polar vortex and kind of the interactions of climate change and El Nino and how they affect the polar vortex. And this was uh, at a, a Christmas time that was particularly um, warm uh, and in the U Eastern United States. And so, um, and it was actually related to the polar vortex, um, even though it was warm. So uh, this, this is a few years old, but that project then um, really let me combine my background in science with art and writing and education. And so it was these little comics, they were kind of one-off comics, not like a whole book of them, but, uh, but that was really exciting to see uh, the reaction to those. 
So for this project, I wanted to apply the same strategy. And to do that, of course, I needed to learn more about Zika and mosquitoes. Um, and I needed uh, to learn about the ecology and how um, the mosquito habitat mapper worked and what people were finding and studying. And so I went to the mosquito section of the Globe Observer website and I found all sorts of useful resources in there that helped me learn. Um, and then I tried out the app and that was fun. Um, and then I talked to Dr. Rusty Lowe um, about what aspects of mosquito ecology or the mosquito lifestyle, as I like to call it, uh, would be most important to communicate to people through the zine. Uh, so to help them stay safe and, um, and you know, get the main ideas. So together we came up with a list of these, these big ideas to communicate, which I then turned into story. And um, I also, um, Thank you, librarians. I, I uh, went to my local library in Boulder, Colorado, and got a bunch of graphic novels um, to, to look at because I, I really wanted to look at how different authors were using both dialogue and the narrator voice in their graphic novels. So that, that was something I wanted to figure out how I wanted to do through this. So thank you, libraries. Um, but then I... Um, I wanted to make sure uh, that the story was told from a mosquito perspective, which I know is a little strange, but um, in crafting the story, of course, humans need to be included because part of the story of a, a vector-borne disease is um, both the vectors and, and the people or, or other animals um, that, are, that get the disease. So humans are included, but they, um, they are relegated to non-speaking roles. Um, so for example, we have a guy here with some insect repellent and he doesn't really need to say a word. Uh, the mosquitoes do all the talking about what they think of the, the insect repellent and um, they, uh, they can communicate really well what, you know, how that affects them. So keeping it from the mosquito perspective, um, it, it then, it made the story a really different sort of story from uh, nonfiction information about mosquitoes and Zika. So then after creating the zine, uh, because this is a larger project that um, is trying to get people in many countries around the world to learn more about mosquito-borne diseases and, um, and also how to, um, reduce their spread, we translated the Zika zine into 10 languages. So uh, these are the covers of um, the English, Spanish, uh, French, and Nepali versions. And this was, uh, this was pretty involved to, for us to translate into 10 languages. I mean, we, we didn't, uh, my, my uh, office didn't do this, but um, it, uh, I'm used to having things translated into Spanish and I work with a, a Spanish translator who, you know, she kind of understands my style. So that, you know, that worked well. But then uh, all the other languages, it was just fascinating to see, um, for instance, the word splat um, when the mosquito hits the mosquito netting to see that translated into to 10 languages was really amusing. Um, but the, uh, you can download all 10 versions or any uh, combination that you'd like at the, the Zika Zine webpage. So the URL is SciEd, so that's like science education, S-C-I-E-D, at U, oh, sorry, dot ucar dot edu slash Zika Zine. And so it's available in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Thai, French, Vietnamese, Dutch, Filipino, Hindi, and Nepalese. And um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that we have um, printed copies, a limited number of printed copies of the Zika zine that we're sending out to people um, around the country and around the world. And we have them in uh, English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. If you uh, would like some sent for your library or school or uh, for your outreach work, um, we have the ability to do that in, in the next month or so. Um, 
I think, I don't know, let Cassie or <laughs> uh, someone from Mission Mosquito know uh, to get you on that list or fill out the form. But yeah, I guess I'll stop sharing my slides now and ask, are there any questions? We have one from Rachel. She wanted to know who helped you with the translation. Oh, good question. Um, so it, uh, the Spanish translation is um, by uh, a, a person that I've worked with on tr other translating projects called, uh, her name is Rosario Rusi. And, um, and so the Spanish translation has, a, has an author associated with it. The uh, Nepali translation was also, was done by the Globe Nepali um, uh, country coordinator, I believe. Um, but all the other translations were done by a translation company called TransPerfect. And uh, they are, um, they were very quick. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, translating eight languages, I guess, in two weeks or something like that. But then we sent all of those translations out to the Globe community to, um, and maybe a couple of people on this call, I'm not quite sure, <laughs> um, but to review, uh, to make sure that they look okay. Because you know, most of these languages, um, no one on our staff speaks. And we wanted to make sure the main messages were coming through without any confusion um, or potential misunderstandings. And, um, and so we, we got a lot of help from the GLOBE community on um, making sure the translations were okay and we input edits and, and that sort of thing, um, which was trickier than expected for um, the languages that, that don't have, uh, that have fonts that we don't typically have on American computers, um, like the Thai and the Vietnamese translations and things like that. But, um, but we, got it all in there so it was it was quite a process but it um, it was definitely worth it in the end <laughs> um, I have a question from Drew he'd like to know what kind of feedback did you get from readers or users of the comic because it's a great idea oh thank you well it's very new Drew um, so it has been out since um, let's see, mid-June, I think, or early June, something like that. So I've gotten some very limited feedback at this point, um, but I, I have, um, I think my favorite comment was, I didn't know that mosquitoes could be so cute and so bad, and <laughs> which really sums it up. I think if, um, you know, if I was the reviewer, I'd say, yes, mosquitoes, both cute and horrible. <laughs> So if anyone in this community has feedback from the audiences you work with after you've been using the Zika zine, I'd really love to, to hear the good, the bad, any of it. Um, and uh, is hopefully there'll be more projects in the future and um, the feedback is always valuable. That's great. You know, what Emmanuel was talking about how malaria is very common in East Africa and malaria is actually the greatest killer. So I think that I'm, I'm Malaria mosquito uh, zine should be on the horizon, Lisa. Hmm, that's an interesting. Yeah, let's let's talk about that. <laughs> let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. One of the reasons why I just put this in the chat, but the reason why Zika was chosen over all the other diseases, some of which have much, um, so, some of which, such as malaria, actually affect a whole lot more people, was because the funding came from a government um, uh, initiative. Uh, to fight Zika. So that's, right. but I, I want to point out that when you read the magazine, when you read the zine, sorry, <laughs> that you could, you know, except for the part where, you know, Wanda's feeling violated carrying Zika, many parts of it do pertain to all diseases. And so, uh, and, she, and Lisa does talk about how bed nets do work for malaria, for instance. And so um, it, I think you can use this uh, regardless of whether or not there is a Zika in your location. So, so give a little overview, the, the first, oops, I'm reading the Spanish version. I should be easier on myself and look at the, the English version. Um, as a little overview, the, the story is told in nine parts. Um, if you're not on the website, you can look at my little screen right there uh, for the table of contents. And the first part is about how uh, mosquitoes in different stages of life look different. Um, and so that's going to be um, something that's universal. 
Uh, there's also, you know, how, as Rusty was saying, how mosquitoes um, bite and why mosquitoes bite. Um, and then uh, also that mosquitoes are pollinators, um, that NASA and others are studying mosquito habitats using the Globe Observer um, app and being a citizen scientist. So these topics, I think uh, reproducing in containers, Rusty, that would be one that's pretty specific to 80s mosquitoes, right? Uh, well, actually there's quite a few mosquitoes that are container mosquitoes, okay. uh, including Culex. But yes, uh, Adi, uh, the, these two uh, Adi's mosquitoes that are responsible for these diseases, well also, well there's actually three, but the two, the two that are most common worldwide, which is Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti, those are both um, container mosquitoes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But for instance, malaria mosquitoes, uh, they uh, breed in natural habitats. And mm -hmm. so it is uh, much more difficult uh, uh, sometimes to locate where they're, where they're found. See, that would make an interesting story. Oh, yes. I, I'm all about this. <laughs> I'm taking notes. <laughs> Thank you. So there is a, a part of the zine where uh, Wanda, you know, feeling kind of low because she's got a, um, she's got the Zika in her. She meets an Anopheles mosquito and, um, and Plasmodium um, inside, uh, the parasite inside, and uh, gets to know how there are other vector-borne diseases too, like malaria. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, there's most of the, the individual comics will will translate to other types of um, other types of mosquitoes and other types of vector-borne diseases, and and then you know, um, a couple of them are very specific to Zika. But this was part of the. Um, a project funded by the U.S. Department of State um, to help educate and um, increase awareness of Zika, um, Zika virus around the world or in many countries around uh, equatorial regions in particular, um, and it's called the Globe Zika Education and Prevention Project. I think you answered Teresa's question. She was wondering if there were other um, plans for plans for another uh, zine on the, on the horizon. So I think you kind of get that well, I've always got big plans, Teresa, but uh, yeah, the funding and the plans have to come together at the same time. So <laughs> um, I'll keep working on that. But yeah, there's, uh, there's always plans for more. <laughs> I think, I mean, this sort of format, one of the, one of the things that I really appreciated about this format, and I, I, you know, written children's books and websites and, you know, more kind of nonfiction articles and those sorts of things. But in this format, you really get the depth of a story, but also it's very quick and an and, and easy bite um, to, to take up. So I, I, it's not a huge investment of time on, on someone's part. You're not asking the reader for hours of their time. You're, um, you know, it, it's a pretty, um, a pretty easy kind of um, entry point. And I, I think that given the audience that we're trying to reach is one that may not know so much about science, but they're living in an environment with mosquitoes, like most of us are. Um, and so it, it's an important, um, it's important to become aware, but there may not be this great love of science that you're building off of and helping people um, really, you know, digest deeply um, the content. So, um, so yeah, it's a, I think the format is a really um, fun thing to explore with other topics. And I guess we'll need to look for more funding on the, all those. <laughs> Uh, Rachel has a comment. Um, have you thought of animating the zine to make it available as a video as well as the graphic novel? Ooh, Rachel, you're full of good ideas. That's a great idea. Yeah, I'm writing that one down. <laughs> I love it. Hmm. I think we're almost at the end here, but um, one of the uh, people on the um, chat is interested in getting some hard copies of the Zika okay. zine, like you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, 
share with us um, how to contact? I, uh, I put the link, Rusty, to a Google form that if they're interested, they can fill it in and we'll- Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, so if you, if you scroll up to 12.22 uh, p.m., um, that's a place where you can actually request your uh, zines. And we can't promise that everybody will get as many as they want, but, we, but Lisa has quite a few available to share. Absolutely. In fact, um, my admin assistant's office is full of Zika zine boxes, so <laughs> she would like those out of there. And um, so she has an incentive to send them to all of you. I, I noticed some other comments in the chat, like from Carla, um, handing out the Zika zine at GSA would be awesome. And so, um, yeah, I'll get in touch with you about that. But there is this, um, this form um, that uh, Cassie put together so you can request as many copies as you think you'll use and then we're, we're gonna have to look at the total supply we have divide them up and hopefully you'll get exactly what you're looking for but um, if not then you'll get some <laughs> and I, I also put the link it's the newest part of the chat so if you want to just click on that Google form and enter in the information we should be good then thanks Cassie Great. Are there any other comments or questions or suggestions that you could pass on to Lisa? Put them in the chat. She's here for you. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. It's been really fun. So I'm glad to be able to join you today. Thank you, Lisa. And if you hold on just a second, we'll get to the, our next presenter. And I'd like to, to welcome Sarah and Rachel, the Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library, working with our project, uh, Go Oklahoma. So Sarah, I'm turning it over to you and Rachel now. Hello. Can you guys hear us all right? Yes, indeed. Okay, great. Um, so yes, I'm Sarah, this is Rachel. <laughs> um, we're with the Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library, um, which is a part of the Pioneer Library System. Um, so we're a tri-county system that has 12 branches across three counties. And again, we're at the Southwest Oklahoma City one. Um, so yeah, this has been an awesome opportunity for um, our staff and our patrons to get involved with this program. Um, and yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started. So um, after Cassie and Rusty um, came and trained us and gave us some awesome microscopes, um, the clip-on microscopes, then we um, turned around with an adult program to start off. So I'll go ahead and let Rachel talk about our first program for adults. We had three people attend, and that was pretty good for just a normal program. And we had a presentation that Sarah did, and we walked around and we let them look at a mosquito that we found in one of our traps the day before, and everybody really loved that. Mm -hmm. So they all signed up that day, and they all took home micro microscopes mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and it was really good. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, so for thoughts on our first program, um, this one had a super quick turnaround. It was a, it was only a couple of weeks, and so we just kind of blasted what we could um, to get interest. But if we had more, um, more time for that, I think we could generate a whole bunch since we got three without even that much time. And yeah, and also a note um, for other folks that are thinking of having programs, um, it was helpful to have an FAQs kind of packet um, ready to go for them to take. Um, when they went home from that. We made our own, but we would probably be able to publish it on the Google Docs. Yeah, if we yeah, yeah, could. yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, and then so, we had our second program, which was our children's age eight to 11. Yeah, um, so we, over the summer, we had um, a Discovery Camp series over our summer, summer learning challenge um, for the kiddos. So um, for this, we had a series of programs on different STEM topics um, weekly. Um, and there were two day camps. The first day we would do um, a STEAM activity of some kind. Um, and some of the things were like engineering, um, chemistry, um, gravity, stuff like that. So um, the first day we would have an activity. And then the second day we would have someone from the field come in and talk about what it looks like to have a career in that, um, in that area of study. 
um, and also do some more activities with the kids. So um, we had two age groups for that. We had five to seven and eight to 11, but we thought this activity was better for eight to 11 with the microscopes. Um, so yeah, so we just went with eight to 11. And so we did an email blast to everyone who had registered for those and been attending um, to get them to sign up for a bonus discovery camp. Um, and we just squished this one into one day. But um, so that's how we got people. And so we had about 10 kids um, come back and um, we asked uh, Dr. Franca to come out and he actually, he used the Zika zines to talk about the, the, life, um, the life cycle of the mosquito. Um, and then we had them design and create their own overtraps, which I think was um, a really big hit. You'll see some of the, um, you can see the, that cup right there um, with the, the feathers taped to it. <laughs> that is his overtrap that he's going to take home and use. So, um, and then we, um, Dr. Frank also brought some larvae. So then we um, gave them the clip-on microscopes and walked them through how to use those. Um, and then they all were able to send in their observations on the Globe Observer app. Um, so then thoughts on our, on our second program. So just for future, future reference for us, we, um, we originally had the account creation as, um, as a walkthrough in the program itself, but for kiddos that are bringing their parents' phones, um, we thought that would probably be best done beforehand because of the email authentic authentication that was required. So we had to kind of hunt parents down, which is fine, but um, just in the future, it would take less time out of the program. And um, yeah, and then the, the kids, um, Dr. Franca uh, stayed and we talked about how quickly the kids picked up on, on the technology, on the app, it was very, very quick. And then also the microscopes, they were super comfortable with those. So um, it was an awesome, awesome program for them. Um, so yeah, in the future, I think we really wanna um, make a series out of, out of this app um, to include the, the mosquitoes and also the other um, aspects that are available. Um, we would love to incorporate this into the summer learning challenge and make it um, a way that they can get points toward the prizes that we have already. Um, or maybe also make it its own challenge with incentives across, um, across the months of mosquito season so that we can um, promote uh, prolonged um, activity. Yeah, yeah, activity, <laughs> involvement, um, participation. Um, so yeah, and I also the make your own overtraps was great. So um, they can be less dependent on us for the resources. And we even had one participant say that she was going to um, replicate this program with her Girl Scout troop. Um, so that was really awesome. Um, so then I'll talk a little bit about publicity. Um, so our initial promotion of this was to paint this mural on um, this glass wall of our CTC, our uh, computer training center. Um, this is on the way to the restroom, so a lot of people saw it. <laughs> and um, so yeah, we did that and then posted um, the different flyers for the events in that little um, carrier in the middle. And um, yeah, so um, we promoted the programs that way. And then after the programs were over, we also advertised our schedule a librarian feature um, where patrons can schedule time one-on-one -on -one with a librarian to get set up with it. Um, and yeah, in our marketing and communications, um, we sent them information and they did social media blasts. Um, and then one of our selectors notably created a curated list on one of our um, online platforms called Overdrive, which is um, where we have a, a lot of our eBooks and e-audiobooks. Um, she created a curated list call, called Calling All Scientists with a description of the program and how to get involved um, at the various times, but also had a list of um, scientific literacy, like eBooks and e-audiobooks. And she said at the highest point of, of that, 93 out of the 101 books on the list were checked out. And also at the end of the list, there were still 35 of those books that had holds list. So there will continue to be checkouts. So we thought that was an awesome way to not only get people involved in the program, but another way that this program promotes scientific literacy on a larger scale as well for our patrons. So I think that's all. Do you have anything else to add, Rachel? Yeah, I don't think so. Do okay. you have any questions? Yeah, we'd love to answer any questions. 
Well, there are a couple in the chat. Um, uh, from Vivian Bird, she'd like to know how long is each one of your programs? Each of our programs this time was about an hour. Um, for the kids program, we would probably recommend maybe doing, doing an hour and a half. I think, especially if we want to get into feces identification, um, going through that whole process. Right now, we just did the 60 times magnification for the simpler microscope. Um, but if we wanted to do this species identification, we'd probably recommend about an hour and a half. And what is an ovatrap? So the ovatraps, our criteria for creating the ovatraps was that it has to contain, um, be able to contain water um, for a week, yes. Um, and it also had to have something wood in it that could stick out of the water a little bit for the species that lay the eggs on that. Um, and then it also had to be placed in a shady area or that could be part of the design as well. So for those, we just um, collected like bottles, buckets, um, such as that, and then also like craft supplies and popsicle sticks and such as that from, um, from the children's <laughs> art supply closet um, and let them create from that. Does that answer that question? I, I think so. Okay. Yep. Um, and an ovatrap is what you're using to, to get the mosquitoes to lay their eggs and uh, they turn into the larvae then. Yes, and so the kids took those home with them. And also, um, since they made them themselves here, we thought that would enable them to make more if they wanted at home as well with stuff that they have around the house. Perfect. Um, yeah. Rachel would like to know, what kind of incentives did you use to encourage students to participate in a summer learning challenge? So... That is something that we would like to do in the future. We were not able to do that this time, um, but that is definitely something that we would want to do in the future, and we could do that a couple of ways. Um, the Summer Learning Challenge involves um, an accumulation of points per participant, um, and that can be done with learning activities, minutes of reading, um, a whole host of things. So with those points, we have prizes in the branch like a free book or um, you're entered into a raffle um, or you, yeah, there's a bunch of raffle stuff. Um, and so that's kind of our big system-wide summer learning thing that we could incorporate. But I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to think of some more specific like mosquito oriented prizes if we wanted, or, or maybe like a, a, some extra fancy microscopes or something like that. I'd love to think of, of some more, um, potential prizes for incentives for next year. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, tell me about the book list. Is that something that you'd be willing to share? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can get in touch with my, um, with our selector who created that. Um, it's been taken down now since we're past the, past that um, deadline, but um, yeah, we could, we could definitely get a list of the books that were in in that list um, and get that sent out. Not Great. more about mosquitoes, by the way. Some more about like just farming and chickens, which <laughs> I thought was weird, but it was popular. A bunch of si just different areas of scientific literacy. So yeah. Absolutely. Um, and Kristen would like, her basic comment is, it sounds like you did an engineering challenge when making the Ovid trap. So that's a super great connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we were kind of going for. Great. Are there any other comments for the, the Oklahoma team? Well, I'm super jazzed about your project, and I'm excited to continue working with you. So, Us too. Thank you so much for involving us. Yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> All right. Well, Rusty, anything? Oh, I, I was just trying to un unhook here, <laughs> my mute. No, I just want to say, I just think that the way you've taken this and run with it is really, really exciting. Yeah. And I hope that we can capture some of your experiences so that we can share them with others, you know, more broadly than this webinar. But um, especially, I love the engineering challenge, and I would love to uh, talk to you offline about that to see if that's something that we might be able to maybe um, develop together and make as a make an as an asset that we can share more broadly. So Absolutely. thank you for all your great work, both of you. Yeah, it's wonderful. You
All right, well, thank you all for attending the webinar and participating with your questions, your comments, your projects, and your experiences and talents. Um, we'll see you again next month.